and interview with Forrest and Bob. Take one. Bob Quinn here for Blue Poppy Continuing Education in conversation with Forrest Cooper. He has filmed some classes for us here at Blue Poppy. Um, we're we're going to talk about the orthopedic testing uh, continuing ed class. This was uh, what I want to do in general is not what all the other companies are doing. I want to look at the acupuncture education in the U.S., see where there are unmet needs and try to uh, fulfill those needs, fill those needs with uh, Blue Poppy products. In this case, I reflected back <clears throat> my own education uh, at OCOM this was a long time ago. I only had six weeks of uh, two hours uh, a class in orthopedic testing. And it was never then reviewed. It was never uh, demonstrated and accentuated in the clinical experience. So of course, that sort of education goes in one year, out the other. If you don't ever use it um, and it's never emphasized, you're going nowhere with it. Then I witnessed how this was uh, at uh, NUNM, we saw this as a need, and we tried to use our faculty meeting time to bring in people from the naturopathic and chiropractic side to teach the orthopedic testing to the supervisors. And again, it's sort of the one hit wonder. You just do something intensively for an hour and a half, and then you're left hanging. So for those of you who purchased this class, I hope you watch it more than once and, and you find a way to really bring it into your clinical practice. Otherwise, all the tests will go. Uh, because of my emphasis in uh, Japanese styles of practice, I'm aware of the education in Japan. And in this respect, it's quite superior to what we're doing. The, the Japanese, in their acupuncture education, they really learn uh, the orthopedic testing, and they're quite confident in using those tests and, and being able to treat off of the information they get from doing those tests. So all that is prelude. I want to uh, throw it over to you. First of all, uh, do you agree with me that this is a, a real deficit, a real hole in acupuncture education in the U.S.? Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me here, Quinn, um, and congratulations on your retirement. Thanks. 26 years of teaching is quite an accomplishment. You've influenced an entire generation of acupuncturists, and you continue to. So, thank you very much. Thanks. And I think your insight about the lack of really good um, orthopedic testing education is kind of spot on. Um, when I left OCOM, it was that they had one quarter, so 12 weeks of either two or three hours a week. But again, it's not reinforced. Very few of the supervisors know, you know how to do it extensively. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, And so that kind of education really does not do much for the provider because it, an analogy I like to use is it's like acupuncture. If you just go in and you get one treatment, even if it's like a super powerful treatment, okay, you know, maybe it'll stick, but really you're much more likely to have good results if you continue to get the same treatment over and over for a while and reinforce the treatment. So that's an analogy I like to use. And hopefully, like you said, if people like continue to look at the, to watch this, um, watch the, the CEUs, then they can like start practicing them and incorporating them. So the only other thing I would say is, I don't know about what's taught at other schools outside of pretty much OCOM and to a lesser degree on UNM. Um, I mean, they could be teaching a lot more of this stuff in California or Texas or Florida or New York or wherever the schools are. But my suspicion is that, and having looked at a fair number of catalogs for schools for doing research, that that's not really the case. So I think you're pretty much right. It does, it does not get covered very well. 
Well, we all face the same accreditation standards. That's what's driving how many hours of this uh, gets offered, uh, by and large. Or required. <clears throat> right. Well, right. you are required to meet the accreditation standards. Right. Um, and it's an odd uh, thing. In most cases, I feel like we've shot ourselves in the foot with many of our standards. They, it, this has been studied. There was a woman, uh, Elizabeth Talcott, at PCOM in San Diego. She studied going literally through all the reading assignments, hour by hour instruction. Instruction is 90% didactic for the, a, mass, a typical TCM master's program. Acupuncture is a manual medicine. Nine, you can't read a book and be a good piano player from reading the book. You can't do, uh, become a good painter. You can't do good acupuncture if they're being taught, if you are being taught from a, a book. And so that's an example of, but why is it that way? Because of accreditation standards. That's an example of shooting ourselves in the foot by locking in these standards that all the schools have to adhere to. Now, here's a case, <clears throat> uh, I just referred to acupuncture as a manual medicine. Many, many, I don't know what the percentage countrywide would be, many of our patients come to us with physical medicine complaints. Uh, the PTs, they learn these uh, orthopedic tests so thoroughly. The chiropractors learn them so thoroughly. Of course, their patients, for the PTs, 100% of their patients are there with a physical medicine complaint. Uh, maybe nearly 100% with the chiropractors. Uh, in Japan, I think it would be a higher percentage of the patients having a physical medicine complaint. Here, because we have some styles that focus on psycho-spiritual complaints and so on, we're not going to be up as high in the percentage of our patients that are there for physical medicine complaints. But still, knee pain, back pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, it's just so common in an acupuncture clinic. And to not be comfortable in the tests that the chiropractors are comfortable in and the PTs are comfortable in, in a way it's giving almost a, a black eye uh, to our profession that we were really incompetent with that if you look at not you but as the whole of the profession obviously you know your stuff otherwise you wouldn't have me here right right so you know just to kind of riff on this um the number one thing that people seek medical treatment for from mds is and the, the surveys show it's either neck pain or low back pain um, and if you combine those two things, it overshoots the number, um, well, those are the number one and the number two thing. And the number three thing is some kind of sinitis, rhinitis. So, you know, it's incredibly common, not just with acupuncturists and chiropractors and physical therapists, but it's the main thing, the number one thing. And it's like over 50%, I believe, that people are going to see MDs for as well. So being able to like get an accurate assessment of, what is wrong with this person from a musculoskeletal system view, not necessarily from, you know, the energetic view, because we, mm -hmm. this is one of the things that I try to emphasize, like with my needling too, is that, you know, we're working in two different kind of worlds. We're working on the, the muscles, the joints, the tendons. We're also working on the chi, the blood, and yes, we can't really separate those two worlds, and yet in a really, in a really real way, um, they are kind of separate. So, you know, that's one of the things that I kind of emphasize in the, in the coursework that we did. Um, I also wanted to go back to the very beginning of what you were talking about with the 90% of learning being book work. Um, and I do have to take a little bit of exception to that because I, the, the, the time that we spend in the clinic, I think, really should count as a large percentage of that. Um, but in a large way, you're kind of right in that the, you know, the way that education is set up with the number of hours that you have to do of outside work, that correspond with the number of hours of in-class work, if it's a didactic, lab, et cetera. It really is kind of set up in 
and this comes from accrediting agencies, not just from, you know, oriental medicine or acupuncture and herbal medicine um, setting, but like from the Department of Education, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, though, that there's a lot more control in the, in the individual class where the person who's teaching the class has the option of saying, okay, I'm going to make it a requirement that you read the book, which obviously you should be reading the book if you are taking a class, you know. But they can also add in requirements of, okay, I want you to do this amount of outside practice, which I always emphasize in my, in my classes, um, as well as like requiring them actually come prepared. Um, but, you know, you can do things to document that uh, as a teacher. You can also, you know, judge on that based on how well they're doing. But really it's that outside of class, outs or outside of class and in class, practicing the physical, the physical movements, practicing the physical doing of the thing. Um, right. And, you know, the, the yeah. actual... Whether it's rolling or turn your head this way, mm -hmm. tilt your head up, take a deep breath, you know, doing physical exams and making those connections in your brain, but and doing it from a lot of different perspectives. Um, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here. If you've ever been in my class, you know I do a lot of tangents. I'm going to go off onto a tangent about um, AVK, Audio Visual Kinetic Learning. And there's a B, a pop, or parentheses R after the, about reading and such. But, you know, there's this whole idea of, you know, oh, I'm an audio learner. Oh, I'm a visual learner. Oh, I'm a kinetic learner. And, there's a lot of evidence from pedagogy, from research of how learning actually works to show that, that it's a, what's called a neuromyth. Um, and it's not a neuromyth that people might have a specific way that they prefer to learn. It's a neuromyth that matching that kind of, of teaching to the kind of learning that the student prefers actually gets better results. Um, what the evidence shows is that using each of those different methods does the best. So, you know, okay, you might prefer to do reading, so that's a visual or an audio type um, learn. But the evidence is that, and it's like you were saying, you can't learn it from a book. You have to do the rolling physically in order to learn it. You have to do the physical test to learn it. You also need to see them done, right? You need to actually watch an expert do it, and then you need to do it yourself, and you need to have it explained to you, whether it's auditory or reading, and that's how you're going to learn the best. And that's one of the things, going back to the coursework that we filmed, that I really want to emphasize is as you are watching these, it helps a lot to actually have somebody there that you can like press pause, get them into the same position and, you know, actually walk through. You don't have to do like the stretch as a real stretch. You don't have to do the needling, but, you know, you definitely like practice the test as you are watching the, the class, the CEU, the film, whatever you want to call it. How's that for a riff? Yeah, that's how I actually learned the Traeger style. Um, I had a dream that said that this was early in my practice that I should be combining the Monica style, I am pumping cords, the Shudo style, so a, the simplest form of meridian therapy, Sotai, a Japanese movement style, and Traeger. I didn't know anything about Traeger, but very clearly said in the dream. So uh, <clears throat> they're very expensive to do that training. I found someone to tutor me. I would treat her for free and she'd tutor me in Traeger. Then I found another Traeger person. There were videos that only certified Traeger people were supposed to have. I said, well, I'll buy them. Then I'll give you the videos. Just let me watch them. And, <clears throat> but I secretly made bootleg copies. <laughs> Hope the FBI is not watching this. <laughs> the, or the uh, people from Blue Poppy. <laughs> <clears throat> or the people from the Traeger Institute. Yes. And I put it on a big screen TV, 
put a patient on the table and Milton Traeger would do a treatment. I'd do the exact same thing. I did that dozens and dozens of times. Mm -hmm. Then when I finally came to studying with uh, Dean Juhan, who has uh, inherited the mantle, the head of the Traeger style, uh, and he, he received some of my work and he said, uh, don't do the training, you, you've, you've, you've got it. You, mm -hmm. you know, maybe if you do advanced training, you'd get something, but he said, go on to the five day basic, uh, you're not gonna get anything more right. than what you already have. So <clears throat> what you had just described, that's what I did. I just watched the master, the master, again and again and again, and just eventually it started to feel at home in my hands. And listen to what he was saying. And listen to him talk it through, because he wasn't quiet as he was giving the treatment. He was talking it through. Yep. Why did he go from this move to that move and so on? And there were three of those. Uh, so I got to see him work on Parkinson's patients and, you know, just kind of a, a normal patient and, and so on. So, uh, yeah, having real contact with a master that you can watch. Now, ideal would have been that then, you know, Milton Trigger could have watched me work and I could have gotten his feedback, but eventually I got it from, you know, his number one disciple, uh, Dean. Uh, so this idea of repetition, um, at, in this case, we're talking about the orthopedic tests, um, is crucial. Mm -hmm. but, uh, because if you're in clinic with a patient uh, and you have to open up your testing manual, you lose the flow, the sense of flow of the treatment. You actually, I think, have to know them. I'll, so I absolutely agree. Although like for students, when they're very first starting, like when they're in their second year of, of school, I say it's okay for them to look stuff up. Just try to do it before you go back and talk to the patient. But I also wanted to riff on something else that you said, you know, about having the master there to give you feedback. So in pedagogy and in, in the science of teaching and learning, um, it's a whole field called SOGO. It's actually scholarship of teaching and learning. It's another area where I've studied a lot. Um, one of the things that they talk about, though, is, you know, the, about how to give feedback and the importance of feedback. Because, you know, if you are watching the CEU, I absolutely encourage you to, you know, work with somebody else. And, you know, you're only one of y'all are going to get the CEU credits. But, you know, but, you know, give each other feedback. Peer feedback is incredibly important because you're going to have a different idea of what I said than what the other person said, right? Um, and also, so one of the examples that I remember from one of the books I read, um, I think it was Small Teaching, he was talking about, you know, learning to ski, you know, and he'd been doing this way of skiing and then like somebody who was an expert was like, you know, watched him and was like, no, here, and like actually moved his body around. And it's like, oh, that makes so much better sense. So, you know, having somebody there who is an expert is really, really important. So, you know, I really hope you buy and watch the CEUs that we film, but I also hope that you will find somebody, you know, state organizations should be organizing, um, you know, continuing education in person so that they can have people come in, demonstrate these and like, Follow people through the whole cycle of, you know, doing it, getting feedback, trying again, getting feedback, trying again, getting feedback. Because, you know, you said you did it dozens and dozens of times, right? You might have only had to do it one dozen times instead of dozens and dozens of times if you'd had somebody there to give you feedback. So one of the things that I really hope is that, like I said, you know, Acupuncturists in different states will organize with their state organizations, with their colleges, whatever, to have people who really know this stuff come in and you know do weekend seminars. A lot of this you can pick up on a weekend, and then you have to keep practicing it after and again and again and again. Because if you don't keep practicing it again and again and again, you're going to lose it. That's just reality with all education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> the um, thing I, I want to come back to the testing to help people um, who are taking the class. Um, 
What would you say are the top five orthopedic tests? You probably introduced 20 tests in the, uh, I'm guessing. In well, the, between the two, between the two courses, a lot more than 20. So, um, so, so top five, I like certainly, you know, so as is going to be one. Where else are you going to go? Um, so let's, let's approach this a slightly different way and talk about top conditions, right? Um, thoracic outlet syndrome. Because you know, that's going to be definitely going to be one of them. Um, just because there's so many different ways it can happen, um, and by that I don't mean so many different um, like causes, like oh I did this, so that happened. I mean you know changes that happen in the body. Mm-hmm. Whereas like you know with fallen pillow, it's basically you know muscle strain, usually sometimes a subluxation, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's a sprain because of whiplash type stuff, but it's pretty much all the same. Treatment is going to be fairly similar. Thoracic outlet syndrome is going to be very different treatment based on whether it's anterior scalenes, posterior scalenes, pectoralis. I mean, if it's pectoralis, you're not treating the throat at all, right? So it's really important to be able to differentiate which of the causes is the cause for the thoracic outlet syndrome. And so similarly, um, in the lower extremity and the or in the low back, you know, you want to be able to differentiate between herniated disc, SI joint subluxation, and uh, piriformis syndrome. Those are all going to be really, really, really interlocked or interrelated in terms of symptomology, you know. Um, and to a lesser degree, hamstring strain, because hamstring strain can so easily, people say, oh, I have pain going down the back of my leg, and people are like, oh, you have a herniated disc, or sciatica, or piriformis. It's like, well, okay, yeah, but it could also be hamstring strain. It could be you know, these different diseases. So the, so I would say that the, the, the places where it's most important to be able to do the physical exams are where you have a lot of overlapping of the symptoms. Right. Um, another example would be carpal tunnel because you know carpal tunnel the the symptom is you've got pain going down into this part of the hand. Well, it needs to be first of all it needs to be like a specific type of pain. It needs to be that electricy type pain or tingly type pain. But it doesn't have to necessarily be from the carpal tunnel being you know compressed. It could be the lunate bone is sublux, sublux pushing forward and pressing on that median nerve. It could be up here in the elbow and the pronator teres pressing down on that median nerve. Now, a lot of times you have that pain going all the way down, but it could just appear in the hand. Again, with the carpal tunnel, it could be up here in the neck and just appearing in the hand. So being able to you know figure out which of those causes is... Um, is, is most important. Whereas other diseases like, you know, tennis elbow, except for the pronator teres possibility, you're generally not going to have to differentiate that too much. They have pain in through here. Okay, that's, you know, medial epicondylitis. Um, so, you know, it's the, the place where it's really important to be able to do the test accurately would be in the places where you have a lot of different possible um, di- diseases or causes for the disease. And that's where you really want to be able to use these tests to figure out which cause it is so that way you can actually do an accurate approach in terms of the musculoskeletal um, um, causes. You know, you want to hit the right muscle. You want it so that you relax that muscle and it no longer is pressing on the nerve. You want to hit the, you know, get the right joint so that way you can put that joint back in place. Um, and then, you know, again, like I said before, you still want to do the energetics to open up the, all the channels through there as well. So I hope that answers your question well. Right. I'm imagining someone being overwhelmed with a great number of tests and just trying to help them get started. Right. So I hear you saying, you know, here, low back, right. try to get a, a, a foot in the door uh, with those tests. Not that the other tests are unimportant, but just to give you a place to start. So if I could break that down just a little bit, like, so the neck, right? 
doing the vertex compression and the modified vertex compression where you're pressing down on the head, gonna be right up there, along with the adsons, reverse adsons, and rights. Those are gonna be like probably the biggest ones. But, you know, there's other ones where you really want to do also just to be able to, like, the active range of motion and the passive range of motion. So, you know, it's really hard to parse out, like, I just want these specific ones. These are most important because, uh, while it's overwhelming, they are kind of all important. It's just, the kind, it, it takes that repetition. And it also takes, you know, like I would say, repetition in different ways. So, you know... Go back and like look at the thing about, okay, this is how you do this test. But then there's also like, how do you do the active range of motion testing? You know, what does it mean if they tilt their head this way and they have pain on this side versus pain on this side? So kind of start reasoning stuff out. That's one of the things that I really try and emphasize with my teaching style is understanding how and why the test works. So that way... Because if you can get that into your brain, it really helps you to figure out the diagnosis better. Mm -hmm. So did that answer your question well enough? No, I think so. Excellent. Uh, so to support uh, people who are taking your course here in their learning of these uh, orthopedic tests, because that goes off into then, oh, I learned the muscle actions, you know, the insertions and so on what nerves feed this uh, muscle, and, but I forget it. What are the sources that have best uh, informed your own learning for both the orthopedic tests and uh, living anatomy? So, I graduated in the year 2000 with my master's degree from OCA. And in 1999, the year before I started, I started TA for um, Dr. Yang Liu, um, in Twina class. After graduating, I TA, I was a teaching assistant for pretty much every, um, every course, every hands-on course, except for Shiatsu and Qigong, right? So I was a TA with Dr. Joe Coletto for Living Anatomy for three or four years. Um, I was a teaching assistant for structural um, structural diagnosis, which is basically where we where we learn about you know physical exams like this. I was a TA for that for three years, and for that one we had was that Daniel Black or no, that was Nicole Levitt who taught. She was my classmate. Yeah, and she taught for a few years. Actually, I felt feel a little bad because like. Her first year of teaching was the year that I took the course. And, like, everybody's first time of teaching, of course, pretty much sucks. Like, everybody wants to quit their first time trying to teach a course. But she stuck it out. And, you know, she had a little packet that she used, a little course pack that she used. And so, you know, I learned a lot. Again, it's that idea of repetition, getting feedback, and giving feedback is just as important, you know? in terms of how you, uh, in terms of learning something. There's this thing called the explanation effect where if you explain something to somebody, even as you're learning it, you actually learn it better. So, you know, I spent many years, and um, so I taught living anatomy, I taught Twina, I or TA for that, and then, you know, I started teaching Twina on my own. Um, and supervising in the clinic and being a su clinic supervisor. Um, I'm going to be completely honest with you, though. The book that I find most useful for all of this is actually the book I wrote. So, like... Give it a plug. Uh, I'm going to give it a plug. Yeah, so I have a book. Uh, we're going to give it uh, through Blue Poppy here soon, hopefully. I'm still waiting for it to come back from my editor so I can, like... Um, you do the editing and then um, send it off to the evil empire. I really don't like sending Jeff Bezos into space, but it's the Amazon really is the easiest way to self-publish something. Uh, but we'll also have it here at Blue Poppy. Um, and like a lot of the other books, they will do like this test, this test, this test, this test, this test, but they don't give you an overarching idea about the disease. 
um, which, you know, I cover diseases and all the tests. And then I have, in each section, I usually have little, like, little what I call pro tips, which are in a much more conversational voice about, okay, you really want to do this this way because X, Y, and Z. Or, you know, this disease is commonly confused with that disease. Um, herniated disc is often com confused with piriformis syndrome. So you really got to differentiate the two and this is how you do it. Um, so, yeah, I, I like my book the best. Um, the, there's one, I forget the name of the author, Zelensky. Uh, I'm really terrible with names. I've known you a long time, so I remember your name. Um, but, like, you know, it's, it's great because it has pictures. My book doesn't have pictures. But all it is is pictures. And, you know, pictures are good. They can help. But they also aren't enough. It doesn't have enough of the other stuff. So, you know, I like my book the best. And really where I learned all of this from which is kind of the root of your question also, is just learning from different people, you know, and, you know, reading some different books, um, but learning from different people and then teaching it and having to have to go, sometimes I go look this stuff up online, you know. Mm -hmm. um, reverse absence is also called the um, um, ad, ad, or Allen's Maneuver. The Allen's test is where you do the two things on the, the pulses on the <coughs> palm. So, you know, sometimes I look this stuff up online and find out, oh, that has a different name or, oh, that's done slightly differently. And other times it's like, oh, that might be the way they do it, but I prefer the way I do it. So an example of that would be with the absence where you take the pulse, you have them look towards the side that's ill, tilt their head up. Well, uh, you know, tilting the head up, the book the book I was telling you about, the yellow covered one, I can't remember the author's name, they don't have them tilt the head up, and they don't have them take a deep breath, both of which do a lot to engage the scalenes and cut off that nerve or artery, so it causes the radiating down the arm, so it's really important. It's one of the things that people need to understand is... There are different ways of doing a lot of the tests that are, you know, they're slightly different. Um, Phalens is another example, you know, this one, or reverse Phalens, you know. There's entirely different opinions about how long you have to hold it for before you can actually, you know, say, oh, it's carpal tunnel or not, you know. Some people say 30 seconds, some say 60, some say two minutes. I say about 30 to 60 is enough. If it's not causing it by then, it's not likely to be carpal tunnel. So, you know, I learned this from studying, you know, teaching, being a teaching assistant for a lot of different people and then having to have to figure out some of it on my own and then learning that there are other ways people do this and like kind of investigating and looking and being like, no, I think this way is better. Yeah. Well, we'll look for the book to come out. You think in six months or? Oh, hopefully way less than that. The editors had it for months now, and it was one of those things where I was like, at the beginning, I was like, oh, you know, take your time. I'm okay. And then it's like, okay, so they're like, okay, well, I'm taking a little while, but I'm making doing work on it. And then it's like, okay, so where are you at? And they're like, oh, I haven't touched it in three weeks. I'm like, uh, I kind of need it back soon. So hopefully it'll be back to me within like two or three more weeks. And then I can, you know, probably just accept all the changes that they make because they're an editor. I'm not. That's not my field of expertise. And then it can go off to be published. Mm -hmm. I'd like to finish with a, kind of a recommendation. If you're taking this class uh, that Forrest teaches on orthopedic testing, or classes, uh, and you see value, and you see that there uh, was a deficit in your education, I would say reach out to your alma mater. Go call uh, the academic dean. See if they'll uh, contact Forrest. You, you could contact him through uh, Blue Poppy, and see if a um, an alumni event could be organized, Have 
forest come in for two days and teach. Because <clears throat> uh, I mentioned earlier, there are accreditation standards already. I think we, I hope we've made the point that they're insufficient, that not enough education is happening. And so one way to do, uh, to remedy that is just to come at it with postgraduate uh, training, better late than never. And uh, so if you uh, advocate your, uh, the school you graduated from, um, good chance that uh, some of those schools will uh, reach out uh, to Forrest and uh, start helping to move our profession forward. We should be better at this than we, actually, than we currently are. So thank you for coming in to chat. A, a strong encouragement to sign up uh, for these CE classes that uh, Forrest has taught here at Blue Poppy. Thanks for listening. And thank you for having me. Good to see you again, my friend. Good to see you. Bye.